Okay, good morning. Uh, I'll get you to open up to Luke chapter 1. Uh, if you brought your Bible, there'll be one on a seat around you, or maybe you have your device, and that's how you're going to read and follow along on there. Luke chapter 1. Uh, in less than a month, we're going to be having renters in our house as we uh, head off on sabbatical as a family. And so we've been having to get our house uh, ready for these renters, which means we need to clear out a bunch of our personal stuff in order to make room for them to come and make our house their home while we are away. And in this process of getting our house ready for somebody else to live in, I've noticed a couple of things. Um, first thing I've noticed is that you see your house differently through different eyes when somebody else is going to be in your house for an extended period of time. For example, that stain on the carpet that's kind of shaped like South America, that we has been there for so long we don't even notice it, suddenly that stain looks horrible. And all those, you know, drywall spots where you patch drywall and you got those white spots on your wall that have been unpainted for a whole year, suddenly they look like white leprosy spots. I mean, like, they need to get dealt with right away. When you prepare your house for guests, um, you suddenly become aware of all the deficiencies that uh, over time went unnoticed. That's the first thing that I've noticed, that there's stuff that we just got used to in our house. Second thing um, that getting our house prepared for people to live in has uh, made me aware of is just how much clutter and stuff we have accumulated. If you've ever moved a house, you know that same feeling. When you go packing up your stuff, you realize that you have more stuff than you knew about. You've got stuff that you forgot about. You'll find stuff that you didn't even know you had. You'll find stuff with price tags still on it. You'll find stuff that you don't know why you bought three of those because you never even used one of them. You'll find all kinds of stuff. Good stuff, valuable stuff, stupid stuff, too much stuff. And of course, now we're heading into the Christmas season where you will get stuff and you will give stuff. Stuff you want, stuff that you need, stuff that you neither want nor need. More stuff. And so in our houses, we try to find a place for all of the stuff, which is why in time our garage looks, starts to look like this. Right? It's the place where we put the overflow of stuff, because we have nowhere else to place to put our stuff. And so now we can't even park our car in the garage, the whole point why we built this attachment to our house. We can't even use it because of all the clutter that builds up over time. Preparing our house for somebody else to live in it has opened my eyes to some of the deficiencies around our house that need to be dealt with and some of the clutter in our house that needs to be cleaned up. Now, Christmas season is not just the time, of course, where we give stuff and get stuff. It is most importantly the season where we celebrate that God has come. And not just that God has come, but how God has come. That God has come to us in a way that demonstrates His desire to be known by us. He didn't come with a big entourage that kept the curious back. He didn't have a security detail that whisked him from place to place and cut off you know, access to streets so he didn't get impeded as he was going to the next town to preach. He didn't come in a way that they had to set up security checkpoints that only the few with the appropriate spiritual clearance could get in and see Jesus. He came in a manner that allowed anyone and everyone to approach Him, to be near Him, to get to know Him. God came as a baby, breathing our, yes, baby. God came as a baby, breathing our air, walking our dirt, living as one of us. God in Jesus, this is what Christmas is all about, God in Jesus took on our body, our flesh, our face, in hopes that the world would see His. Now, the Christmas story, of course, finds the world totally unaware and unprepared for his arrival, right from day one. If you know the story, you know that his mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, quickly discover that there was no room for them in any of the inns or any of the homes in Bethlehem. There was no room to accommodate God who had accommodated himself to us. The huge irony of the story. Every front desk that they talked to, every doorbell that they rang, they got the same response. We're sorry, we're all full up, man. We're plumb full. No, I'm sorry, we don't have any room. Now, of course, this whole, you know, that whole no room catastrophe could have been avoided if God had just been a little bit more on the ball. 
he had a little bit more, you know, a little bit better project planning for his big project uh, unfolding of Jesus. He could have maybe put together an incarnation committee where they did a whole, you know, PR blitz the nation that something big coming December 25th. Right, they could have done that. He could have sent out the, you know, the pre-scouting entourage party that could have you know, found the best location for Mary and Joseph, booked the VIP suite for them before they arrived, had porters waiting to pick up their luggage and all the news media on hand to cover the whole thing and upload it right to TMZ. They could have, God could have done all of that. But that, of course, is never his way. Max Licato says... God doesn't arrive in a manner that demands our allegiance, but in a manner that displays his affection for us. He comes that first Christmas carried by an ordinary girl, riding an ordinary donkey, a remarkable gift in the most unremarkable package. He arrives in a manner so easy to miss and dismiss that the innkeeper does. The innkeeper missed his opportunity. Do you know, if he just would have like booked them a room, if he would have created space for them in his inn, man, he could have had like the best advertising PR for the whole rest of history. Stay in the room where God stayed, right? He could have been booked up forever in perpetuity. But he was unaware and didn't prepare and didn't create room. And so Mary and Joseph are regulated out to the barn amidst the muck and the mess of everyday life. This is how Jesus arrives, which in itself is a beautiful message of grace that God is eager to meet you and I in the muck and mess of our everyday life, if only we would take notice. If only we would not turn him away. If only we would prepare him room. If we do that, the eternal God promises to come into your story, into your life, and make a home with you. Remarkable. And so the story of how God comes into the world is actually a metaphor for how God wants to enter real lives, including yours, today. Which is why Christmas isn't just celebrating that God came 2,000 years ago. It's more than that. It's even better than that. It's that God wants to come today and make a home with you today. Now, if you've been a Christ follower for years, here's what you can encourage yourself with this morning. That God wants to refresh His presence in your life anew. He wants to be this season Emmanuel, God with you again. And so this Advent series, we're trying to get you ready that Jesus could come to you in a new way, visit you in a fresh, meaningful way. Um, some of you for the first time, some of you for the first time in a long time. We want you to experience Jesus afresh. And so we're going to do what we sang about earlier, what the song in the famous Christmas hymn says, let every heart prepare him room. We're going to try to do just that. We're going to try to prepare room in our hearts that Jesus would come this season and meet with us in new, profound ways so we don't miss him like the innkeeper does. Now, while the moment of Jesus' arrival, while that was utterly understated, the reality of his coming was such a big deal, was so monumental, was so new, was so revolutionary, that in God's thinking, he, he decided that Jesus needed a warm-up act. That Jesus needed somebody who was going to get the cr crowd prepared, get them ready for this brand new thing that Jesus was bringing into the world and for the world. And so, to get hearts prepped and ready, God sets apart this guy named John. Before Mary and Joseph have news about their miraculous baby that is going to be born to them, God goes and visits another family, and they're going to have another remarkable son. Family named Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we're going to discover that God had a plan, a specific plan for their son. We read these words in Luke chapter 1. Elizabeth was barren. She couldn't have kids. And both her and her husband Zechariah were along in years. And an angel appears to Zechariah and says to, the, says to him, Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will give birth to a son, and you're to name him John. 
He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. Now, the reason why, why will they rejoice because of his birth? It was because God had a special purpose for his life, and this was God's purpose for John's life. John will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Did every heart prepare him room? That was part of John's job description. That's what John was to do. He was the opening act before Jesus takes the main stage. He was the one to get the crowd ready and get the people prepped for Jesus. Now, how did he do that? How did John prepare people for the Lord? Well, I want to show you this morning two things that John does to get people ready for Jesus' new work in their lives. And I want to suggest to you that those same two things God wants to do in your life to get you ready to meet Jesus afresh this Christmas. Now, if you know the story about John, let me grab a drink. If you know the story about John, he's called John the Baptist. Not because he wasn't John the Anglican or John the Pentecostal, but he was called John the Baptist because as far as we know in history, he was the first person that baptized people. He's the first guy that did that. Now, John comes uh, into uh, his ministry and begins to publicly speak for God in a time before Jesus had ever stepped on the scene. So nobody heard about Jesus. They start to hear about John. But he begins his ministry at a time when people were uber religious. Like, to understand why John was so revolutionary and why he was such a big deal, you need to understand this. He came at a time when they had the religious systems down pat. Like they had everything choreographed between them and God. They had their holiday traditions nailed. They knew exactly how to respond in every spiritual situation. If some aspect wasn't, of life wasn't going well, they know that you prayed this way. If some life, part of life was going really well, you celebrate that way. If you knew that you did something wrong and offended God, there was a particular sacrifice that you'd bring at a particular time of the year to a particular person in this grand spanking new temple that Herod, the guy who, you know, baby killing Herod, that Herod had just built, this brand new state-of-the-art facility. They had that place. So they, they had all the systems in place. Everything was dialed in. They knew the routines. And they had this brand new jaw-dropping state-of-the-art facility where God would meet with them. And so the people thought stuff between them and God were great. Everything is well in the religious world. That's what they thought. And besides, all throughout history, when things weren't good, God told them so. God would send a prophet. He sent lots of prophets through history and was like, stuff, people, stuff, it isn't good. This is what you need to do to get right. And God hadn't said anything since the end of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. God had not said anything for 400 years. Radio silence. And so the people are thinking, no news is good news. So God must be okay with us and everything is on the up and up. And John steps into the pages of history as the bad news opening act to get people ready for the good news performance that Jesus is going to pull off. And when John shows up, he gets attention, not just because of what he says, but because how he looks, because he is weird. He's just like weird. Like he lives out in the woods and he wears animal skins and he smells like he lives out in the woods and he doesn't never been to a hairdresser and he doesn't use any product and the hair is all over the place and not only that he eats like his he's got this bizarre culinary taste he eats like wild honey and bugs that's all he eats like how do you invite this guy for dinner like what do you serve him you got to like sweep stuff out of the crawl space and you serve that up on it like I don't know what you serve this guy for dinner he's just weird right and he shows up and he speaks this message that pierces 400 years of silence. And this is what we read. John went out into the country around the Jordan River, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight. The rough ways smooth. And all the people will see God's salvation. So John shows up and he looks like he's right out of central casting for an Old Testament prophet. And he begins to tell the people that all is not well. 
It's not good. You need to get your heart ready. You need to get your houses prepared for what's coming because what is coming is God's salvation. What God is about to do, which is going to be amazing, if you do not realize your need, if you do not see the reality of your own sin, you're going to miss it. Because for the good news to be good news, it must invade dark spaces. It must travel down crooked paths. And so John's job was to make people aware that the darkness that the light was coming into was not just out there, it was in here. And the crooked paths that had led people away from God were not somewhere else, they were the paths that everybody was walking. And so John is calling people to recognize their own brokenness, to recognize their own sin and turn from it. And as they did, it was called this act of repentance. And repentance was acknowledging and, and hating that sin that is in our lives. Those things that we do that are beneath our dignity. Those things that fill us with grief. Those things that fill us with this longing just to have this, I just want this thing off of me and out of my life. To be free of it. And John was stirring up those feelings. And people were, were resonating with what he was saying and they're beginning, they begin to confess, they begin to turn from their sin and the people respond. So much so that Mark says this. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went to him confessing their sin. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, you've you got to get this in your head. It's such a big deal that everybody from Jerusalem, I mean, they're traveling a whole day's traveling. They're walking like 22 miles. Like they're, they're going on a trek in the middle of nowhere to see this nobody who's not part of the religious system. He's not part of the religious order. He's not part of the temple. But clearly God is speaking to him and through him. And so thousands of thousands of people are coming out and they're hearing what he has to say. And he's saying this, get ready. Prepare yourself for something new, for someone new that's about to break into the scene. And his words, cut them, his words cut them to the core and they respond. So John's job, the first thing that he does to make people prepared for the Lord, to, to get them ready, is he makes them aware of their brokenness. He makes them aware of the desperate condition that they are in. And people start confessing their sins. And whenever church, people begin confessing sin, it creates this heart space. It creates this room for the one who deals with sin to come in. That's what, that's what bad news does. It creates space for good news. When we were in Africa uh, a number of years ago, ago, as a family, after we were doing some mission work, we went on a safari. And we were uh, in uh, Masamera in Kenya, and we were staying overnight in like the Kenyan forest, like it's just a wild park. And so there's no hotels there, so there's tents. So we had tents set up that we were sleeping in. So we're sleeping in tents out in the middle of the African wilderness. And uh, we had two tents set aside for our family, and then we had a kind of a long trek to the cooking tent where our guide would help prepare food and we were eating and we were there one evening and we're heading back to the tent and our, our guide Jackson uh, says to me, he's like, I got some bad news. He says, be careful as you walk back to your tent. Be aware, be on guard for snakes. And not just any snakes, there's a particular snake that he told us to be aware about called puff adders. And, and puff adders are, there's, they're like, oh, they're just... They're just demonic creatures. They're horrible creatures. They're, they're the color of like the forest floor. They're all camouflaged like leaves. And what they like to do is that they're slow moving snakes. So they're an ambush hunter. So they'll kind of bury themselves in the leaves and keep their head free. And they'll do it along paths that are traveled by animals or two legged animals. And when a little furry rodent goes by, it'll like strike it and put its venom in there and then it'll eat it. And so, as soon as my kids heard about the bad news about the snake, something really interesting happened. They just wanted to get really, really close to dad. My youngest one is like climbing up here and she's riding up on my shoulder and my other one wants to hold my hand. Why? Because the good news in their mind is that dad will protect us from the snake. If you knew anything about me and snakes, you know that that was a terribly misplaced hope. 
Because had we have bumped into a puff adder, I was just as likely to throw one of my kids at it and run the other way because the truth is I am a terrible savior, especially when it comes to snakes. But the principle remains that bad news, and we are aware of it, when it like sinks into the reality of our heart, it makes space for the good news. It makes us long for good news. You see, people who recognize their sin, not just their sin once upon a time, not just your sin that you recognized 20 years ago when you accepted Jesus and asked Him to be your Savior. People who practice today, now, the rhythm of confession, it creates space in your heart for God to come to you in new ways. That's the gift of confession. It clears out the heart clutter that sin creates and it instinctively causes us to grab hold of Jesus' hand and pull Him in closer. Because we see that we need Him today. Confession makes our heart pine for the Savior. And as such, it's a gift. Jesus comes to us as Savior and Forgiver. He is kept at arm's length from people who do not confess. And He comes in closer than your breath to those who do. Confession prepares Him room. So let me just pause and ask you. When was the last time that you took an honest inventory of what's going on in your heart, in your life? When was the last time you laid your heart bare before God and let Him speak to the things that you're doing or not doing that are beneath your dignity? When was the last time that you've done that? See, God calls us to do that not so that we'll grovel and feel terrible about ourselves. No! He does that so we'll clear out the clutter of sin and see how, or see afresh how good His grace is and invite Jesus to come in closer. So John, getting the people ready with his preordained role to prepare them for the good news of what God is doing makes them aware of the bad news, which is why his coming was necessary. You know, the Christmas song that we sing, we sang it earlier, the line says all of that. Long lay the world in sin and error pining. See, what is the world pining for? When, when you see your sin and error, then you pine for the Savior. Till, or long lay the world in sin and error pining, till He appeared. And guess what? In our story, that's exactly what happens. We read that Jesus did just that. He appeared, He shows up to John's baptism fest. He walks out with the crowd and He goes to where all the people are gathering and getting baptized. Jesus walks out to where the masses of people are seeing John. And John, we're told, sees Jesus coming. And at this moment, like this moment is so huge in the history of the world. At this moment, Jesus knows who He is and John knows who He is. And that's it. Only these two people. This is a moment that would change everything. This is a moment where, where Jesus is about to publicly step into the stage of His ministry. Where He'll begin three years that will lead Him to a cross, that will see Him bound and wrapped and buried in a tomb, that will see Him bust out of that same tomb. It's all about to begin right now. This man's life that would change the world. At this moment, Jesus is beginning something that will lead to millions of people today. I mean, right now, there are millions of people around the globe giving praise to God for the grace that they've experienced in their life because of Jesus. That moment begun all of this. Began all of this. That's the word I wanted. And it's all about to begin. And Jesus knows it and John knows it. John also knows that his whole life calling all of his efforts, the whole reason that he's been born was building to this one moment. And these two guys lock eyes. John, the preparer of the way. Jesus, who is the way. John, who calls people to confess their sins. Jesus, who will forgive them. They lock eyes. And at this moment, John does the second critical thing that you and I need to do if we're going to prepare our hearts to encounter Jesus. You know what John does? He says, look. Look. Up until now, all eyes had been on John. He's the big thing that's been happening. He's the one who's drawing crowds. And John says, look. 
Lay your eyes on Him. Lock your eyes on Him. And every head swivels from John and turns to Jesus. But John continues. Look, the Lamb of God. Now, of course, these are Jews and their mind would have went back to all the Jewish stories about the Passover Lamb, about the Lamb that the people would raise up and they'd bring and they would offer the Lamb to God and they would sacrifice it and God would kind of like forget about their sins for a year. He'd defer payment of their sins for a year. And John is saying, this is actually God's Lamb. God is now sending the Lamb. You're not going to provide the Lamb anymore. God is doing it. This is the Lamb that is from God. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. The one who lifts up and carries away our sin. And not just for a few, not just for the lucky ones, not just for the powerful, not just for the best among us, not just for the Jews, but for the sins of the whole world. My sin, your sin, he's going to deal with it all. This is the one. Look at him. As we anticipate and we prepare for God's coming into the real stuff of our lives this Christmas, I want to call you to do the same thing that John did. I want to call you to look at Jesus. And by that, I don't mean just give him a quick glance. I want you to lock eyes with him. Maybe you've never done that before. Maybe you've heard about him. Maybe you know some stories. Maybe you sang some songs, but you've never stopped in your tracks and turned your gaze and locked eyes with Jesus. Until you do that, you will never know what you were made for. You will never know the potential that God has in you. You will never know a love so big that you can get lost in it until you look. Long lay the world in sin and error pining until He appeared and the soul felt its worth. You will never feel the worth of your soul until you do what John says. And look. Look. Some of you looked upon him once upon a time. You prayed a prayer. You invited Jesus into your life, whatever that means. Don't get me started about that. You said a prayer, you invited Jesus into your life, and then you continued along your way, and you thought that Jesus was kind of like the pet dog that just kind of follows you wherever you go. And so you went along your merry way, hoping that he's going to tag along right alongside you. And you know the story of God with us, but you do not know God with you. If you're honest, you've never really experienced God with you. It's because you haven't looked. You haven't really turned your head. You haven't really sent your gaze upon him. So I'm asking you today to do that. Will you take the next 23 days and do what John says and look to Jesus? And you're like, okay, well, how do I do that? Well, you can take one of the Bibles that are in the seats around you. You can have that. It's our gift to you. If you don't have one or if the one you have is like white leather and about 40 pounds and it's got little baby cherubs on the front, you take one of ours. It's way easier to read, way easier to understand. Take one of our Bibles with you and we're going to ask every person in our church that over the next 23 days we're going to read the Gospel of Luke. Why Luke? Well, because Luke's just like us. Luke didn't grow up a Jew. He was a Gentile. Luke was a historian. He's a historian's historian. He's so... He's so like detail-oriented. He's so curious that he went out and he interviewed and he tried to get to the, the bottom of what happened. Why is all these people's lives changed? Why are they saying this thing? What happened? What is around this amazing man, Jesus? And he documented his life in such a profound way that if you give Luke time, he will set your gaze on Jesus. And I promise you, you'll see something. And this is what you're going to see. You'll see how utterly brilliant and magnetic and loving and good Jesus is. Maybe you'll see that for the first time or the first time in a long time. And when you see how good He is, when you see how loving He is and how kind He is and how magnetic He is, when you will see that God gave Him over to death to purchase you, you'll get a glimmer of what God thinks you're worth. Your soul will begin to feel its worth. Long lay the world in sin and air pining 
John was going to tell them about their sins so they would pine for the Savior till he appeared. And John said, look at him. Then the soul felt its worth. So to prepare your heart, God sent John to help us see, be aware, self-aware of our need for grace and then to fix our eyes at the one person who personified grace. And so may this Advent, church, May this Advent do for you what John the Baptist did for Israel, spiritually prepare you for Jesus' coming. Let's pray. God, this room is packed full of people who you just adore. If you had a fridge... Every single one of our pictures would be on the door. When guests came over, you'd be pulling out the picture book and showing them our picture because you just love us so much. And that's the whole reason why Jesus came was to bring good news and the bad news of our estrangement from you. To bring good news, the bad news, to, to the emptiness our soul feels apart from you. We know what that's like. We, we, we run after so many things, relationships and material stuff and success and position and recognition. And we put those stuff into our soul and it, it just rattles around in there and it's still too small to fill us up. So we look for the next thing and the next thing. We're on this treadmill of running for the next thing that we hope will satisfy, which ultimately never does. It's because the only way our soul finds its worth is when we see the worth of who you are. And so I pray, God, that your grace would make, make us aware of our darkness and the crookedness of some of our path. And when that lead us to the gift of confession, and when that actually clear the clutter out of our hearts and make space for the good news of Jesus to come with his grace, I, I pray that every single person in this room will, will heed John's call to look on him. They will take your word. They will, they will read the story of Jesus. See what he was really about, what he was really like, what he really said. See for themselves. And may, in doing that, they see the one who is of infinite worth, given because you think we are of infinite worth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening.